Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. On the show tonight. Unfortunately, in Little Village itself, we're still very low. The latest on the census, COVID-19, and more in Little Village. We're facing what is shaping up to be one of the great civil rights struggles of our time. One on one with former Illinois Governor George Ryan on his decision to end the death penalty in the state and life after his six and a half years in prison. We've got to get down before we go into the more problematic winter. A grim milestone as the U.S. surpasses 200,000 COVID deaths. A look at the country's response to the pandemic. Back. Trubisky will air it out. All right, that was a good pass, but the rest of the performance was uneven for Mitch Tubrisky. Can he do better against the winless but high-scoring Atlanta Falcons on Sunday? A network of Chicago block clubs aims to bring neighbors together on the south side. And it's National Public Lands Day this weekend, how you can celebrate with the Cook County Forest Preserve. And as was mentioned, I'm in Little Village where we'll be talking with vendors from the neighborhood's beloved discount mall could be facing the threat of redevelopment. Also, census organizers and community groups who are helping residents navigate the pandemic. But first, Paris, back to you for the day's top stories. All right, Amanda, we'll look forward to that. Some early voting is now underway across the state. That includes more than 1.7 million vote by mail ballots being sent out by election officials. More than 400,000 of those each have been sent out in Chicago and suburban Cook County. Early in-person voting has also begun in select sites in suburban DuPage, Will, Kane, Lake, and McHenry counties. Chicago will open its Loop Super site to early voting on October 1st, and early voting in suburban Cook County starts October 7th. And Illinoisans could be facing a 20% across-the-board income tax hike. A warning came today from Illinois' Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, who says the drastic move might be necessary if voters do not go to the polls to approve the constitutional amendment for a graduated income tax. Stratton says she and the Pritzker administration do not want to go the route of a general tax hike, but may have no other choice. It will only serve to deepen the dramatic inequities that we already see across the state. It will drive out our residents and it will drive out investment in Illinois. The so-called fair tax amendment would need the approval of 50% plus one of all voters or 60% voting specifically on that question in order to become law. The strike is over. Nurses and the University of Illinois Health System have agreed on a tentative four-year labor deal. The Illinois Nurses Association says the school has agreed to hire 160 full-time nurses in the next year, addressing the union's concerns about staffing levels. Nurses and university workers represented by SEIU Local 73 walked out nearly two weeks ago and have been picketing ever since. 1,400 nurses in the Illinois Nurse Association Union still have to ratify that deal. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Paris, thank you. Little Village, or La Villita, as it's known by residents, is known for its rich Mexican culture. But some residents and business owners fear a neighborhood staple could be in danger. As part of our Chicago Tonight In Your Neighborhood series, we're back in Little Village, a neighborhood that's part of the South Lawndale community area. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Venicky joins us there live from 26th Street, Amanda. Yes, Brandis, this archway over my shoulder, a gift from Mexico. Greeting visitors, bienvenidos a Little Village. It has become a neighborhood emblem. Now, just to my right is another neighborhood mainstay, the Discount Mall, which houses scores of shops that are run by independent vendors. Daisy Reyes, his family has had a booth there for decades, really since the discount mall opened. Now they've got two. IMEX imports sell sombreros, other traditional Mexican attire, also baby clothes, soccer, soccer shirts, a little bit of everything, she says. She says the shopping center is more than a tradition, it's family. This is a, a Hispanic community, so anything you want, like from Mexico, <clears throat> sorry, you'll find here. So it's like a lot of items you cannot get anywhere easily, you know, and people know that and they come straight to here to find those things. And it's people's lives, like all their life, like us, we've been here more than 30 years. 
but she says some shoppers have stopped coming under the misguided impression that the mall is closed. Chicago developer Novak Construction bought the plaza in February. Novak has previously worked with big box stores, stoking fears that that is what is going to happen at this shopping center too. We asked Novak Construction for a response and it, there's agreement on this point at least that there is a whole lot of hearsay. Although rumors and misinformation have surrounded the plaza for months, the owners wish to convey that there will be no redevelopment plans this year as they seek to understand the market and the neighborhood better. It was a statement given to us from Novak, a statement by the way first written in August and it did not otherwise give any specifics about the mall's future. The company says that it recognizes the plaza as an anchor of the 26th Street Shopping District and plans to bring much needed care and attention to property it says has been long neglected. That includes, Novak says, hosting community food distribution events last month, plus other family events expected this fall. The owner of mall shop Source Fashion, it's got an inventory of those beautiful, bountiful quinceanera dresses, says she's worried because of Novak, the mall represents money, but to her and to her clients, she says it represents their culture. Llegas a este lugar, te sientes identificado, te olvidas de que estás en, en Estados Unidos, sientes que estás en tu país, te da una nostalgia y te sientes muy cómodo. Entonces, nosotros lo que queremos es mantener el concepto. Nosotros no nos oponemos al progreso. Queremos ser incluidos en el progreso. Nuestra pregunta es, ¿por qué no podemos ser incluidos en ese progreso? Meanwhile, like elsewhere, little village residents are coping with COVID-19. In the early days of the pandemic, Little Village was one of the areas with the highest number of COVID-19 cases in the city. Now, overall, the zip code that encompasses Little Village has had more than 5% of the total coronavirus cases in the city of Chicago. Alderman here, Michael Rodriguez says, leaders in the community meet Weekly, he says it's in an effort to contain COVID, but he says area residents are facing additional challenges too. There are federal policies that do not allow for all benefits to be eligible to undocumented immigrants. And the fact is the 60623 area code that's disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 is also disproportionately impacted by federal policies that do not allow for our community's economic advancement. Grassroots leaders are stepping up for three months now, holding a community resource fair in a park that's actually near a COVID-19 testing site where community members can get food, clothing, flu shots, fill out census forms. There is an emphasis on outreach to Spanish speaking residents and advertisements for a hotline that they can call to access direct support in Spanish. It's also a mental health uh, support. We have the painting class. We have conversations. We sit down and look at each other's eyes and share how things are going at home. So it serves as a mental health space. For us, it's like the battery. This is my battery. A safe way to be part of community in an isolating time. Parents feeling particularly stressed out, especially because of all of that remote learning. A program for that also underway. Spanish speaking volunteers will soon be helping families with two hours each week of technical assistance. It's not going to be your typical tutor, like how do you answer this math problem or how do you write a perfect sentence? It's going to be more like, how do I submit this or how do I even get my homework that the teacher sent me? Volunteers are still in training, but these tech tutors should be ready to help Spanish speaking families in the area in just a couple of weeks. Now we'll be returning soon with the area's representative, the youngest member of the Illinois General Assembly. But for now, back to you in the studio. Amanda, we'll see you in just a bit. Thank you. And now to Paris for a one on one with a former Illinois governor, Paris.
Brandis, two days before leaving office in January 2003, Illinois Governor George Ryan commuted the death sentences of state convicts to life in prison, effectively emptying Illinois' death row. Years before, Governor Ryan reignited the national debate on capital punishment when he declared a moratorium on the state's death penalty. His own career ended with political corruption convictions, but Governor Ryan is expounding on the death penalty in a new book with co-author Maurice Posley called Until I Could Be Sure How I Stopped the Death Penalty in Illinois. And joining us now from his home in Kankakee is former Illinois Governor George Ryan. Governor Ryan, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, uh, Paris. I'm glad to have the opportunity. Uh, we're, we're, we're glad to have you, and, and I read your book, and uh, it, it's a very compelling read. You talk about what a long emotional journey this was, because in the 1970s, as a state, legislature, a state legislator, you were for the death penalty, and you voted in favor of it. Uh, tell us about your thinking back then. Well, that was in 1977 when the uh, United States uh, Supreme Court authorized the states to reinstate the death penalty in America. And uh, it was a very uh, vigorous debate on the House floor. I was a member of the Illinois House at the time. And uh, we had a really good discussion about the death penalty. And uh, so I flipped my button green to vote for it. And a Democrat on the other side of the aisle uh, by the name of Bob Mann, who was a pretty liberal uh, fellow, but got up and said, for those of you that are voting green here today, how many of you would be willing to throw the switch to kill somebody? Hmm. And uh, that made me kind of pause a little bit to think about it. And I thought about it for a while and I said, well, I think it's probably necessary to have the death penalty on the books and we should keep it. It's maybe a deterrent, but uh, we, we need to have it. Uh, so I didn't change my vote. I uh, continued to vote. Uh, green and it passed, but little did I know that uh, I said I didn't want to. I didn't want to throw the switch, but we had to have the bill. So I uh, voted to continue to vote green and it passed. And little did I know that some 20 years later that uh, I'd be the guy that would basically be throwing the switch. So clearly, clearly, you you know it weighed on your mind back then, and you talk about the long journey you took to change your mind. As governor, the seeds of doubt were really sown in you uh, with the case of Anthony Porter, which uh, students at Northwestern, the Northwestern Innocence Project, had worked to exonerate. Why did this case affect you so much? Well, that's the, the, the case that brought my attention to the death penalty. You know, when you run for public office, uh, uh, as, as I had, uh, you get questionnaires every time there's an election. And of course, there's one that comes from the from the death penalty people, and they say, are you in favor of the death penalty? And I always marked it yes, and uh, believed in it and thought it was good. Uh, but uh, the death penalty people uh, decided that uh, they needed to have the death penalty, so I stayed with them on it. And that's what got me going. But I was sitting in the mansion uh, watching the, the uh, news from Chicago on the television when I look up and here's little Anthony Porter coming out with a big grin on his face after spending 16 years on death row only to be found innocent of the charges. And I said to my wife, how does that happen in America? Put a fella on death row for 16 years. He wakes up every morning and says, I wonder if this is the day they're gonna throw the switch on me. So I decided that uh, maybe there was something that needed to be looked at. There had to be something wrong with the system. And that's when I started to change my attitude and my thoughts about the death penalty. It was the Anthony Porter case that turned me. And you, you, found, you found a lot of things wrong with the entire system. So tell me about the things that were red flags to you. Well, the Tribune then did a, a series during the course of our, our my, my involvement. They did a whole series of pointing out the things that were possibly could be corrected and, and never were. But like prosecutorial misconduct, uh, prosecutors, it, uh, had wanted to make a case and do about anything they could from torturing a, a prisoner or, or uh, telling them falsehoods about them. You had uh, jailhouse snitches, probably the worst kind of testimony you can get in any kind of a case. And everybody knew it, but they continued to use these people that wanted to, to take care of their own uh, sentences by cooperating with the federal authorities. You had uh, prosecutor, uh, defense attorneys that uh, didn't do, like they tried and got disbarred or were having uh, medical problems or whatever of their own and never gave them 
gave the defendant the, the full measure of their services. And so it was, uh, it was one of those things that I just said, you know, we got to have a look at this. And, and clearly, I liken it to uh, flying an airplane from Chicago to Boston, and the plane crashes three days a week. I would guess you'd stop the plane from flying at all and try to fix it. You don't want to play those percentages. So in, a, in the book, you talk about you agonized over the decisions you had to make to either commute some folks' sentences or to not uh, step in and, and stop uh, the death penalty. So take us behind the decision first uh, to institute the moratorium and then years later to uh, clear all of death row, issue just a blanket commutation. Well, the moratorium came when, uh, when I got a call from um, from the uh, state uh, attorney general uh, to, that they had some more cases in the pipeline that were coming to my desk and I needed to sign the one for uh, Anthony Corpialis uh, so they could continue to, to send them in and they're gonna, so, cause I was gonna have more to sign. And I decided I didn't want to sign any, any at all, including Corpialis, and that was a long discussion. And Corpialis, he, to, to be clear, he was, he was convicted of heinous rape and murder charges. He was a terrible guy and he deserved what he got. But I had, uh, you know, everybody said, you know what, but we had uh, a case like Anthony Porter who spent 16 years uh, as a guilty man on when he really wasn't guilty. And I had some strong opposition uh, to, to, the, to the execution of Andy Corker Alice, and it was mainly from the religious groups. And uh, he was a Greek fellow and uh, the Greek church and the bishop were very actively uh, after me every day uh, to stay his execution. But I finally decided that it was the right way to go and uh, made that decision. But I made it known then that I would not sign any more uh, death row inmates just to, to, to make sure they got executed. I wouldn't sign any more papers for that. So uh, that's how we got to the moratorium. And we'll be joined again by former Illinois Governor George Ryan later in the program to discuss his own conviction and time in prison. But for now, my thanks to Governor Ryan. And now we go to Phil Ponce and a grim milestone for the country. Phil. Paris has of this week more than 200,000 people in this country have died from COVID-19. That's roughly equal to the population of Salt Lake City, Utah. Joining us to explain how we got here is Dr. Emily Landon, Associate Professor of Medicine and the Executive Medical Director for Infection Prevention and Control at U Chicago Medicine. Dr. Landon, thank you for joining us again. And uh, just uh, what does it tell you that uh, this country has reached this figure of 200,000 uh, fatalities? This, this is such a tragedy. We did not need to have 200,000 Americans die of COVID. This and, and we're not finished yet. Well, as we look at the death chart from this year and with winter coming, when more people are going to be indoors, uh, what is the likelihood of again reaching the single day death toll from last April 14th when nearly six and a half thousand people died? Unfortunately, I am very concerned that our cases are going to go up again. Of course, I don't have a crystal ball, but all of the signs point toward a worsening as people come indoors and we have to contend with ventilation systems and being close up with other people in sort of a limited airspace. When uh, asked about the figures, the president says that but for uh, the administration's actions, it could have been much worse. What is your reaction to that? Well, it is true that things could have been worse than they are. But that does not mean that we have done the kind of job that we needed to do. Certainly, there are many other countries who improved their numbers to a much more favorable degree. I would be, I would feel much better about going into the winter with a much lower rate of COVID on an ongoing basis. We're still losing about a thousand Americans every day, and having to go up from here doesn't seem very good to me. Uh, yesterday during a Senate hearing, Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky challenged Dr. Anthony Fauci, asserting that in the case of New York, for example, that they could have already developed herd immunity. Let's listen. They have enough immunity in New York City to actually stop. I challenge that, uh, Senator. I'm afraid, because I'm afraid I, I want, please, sir, I would like to be able to do this because this happens with Senator Rand all the time. You were not listening to what the director of the CDC said that in New York, it's about 22%. If you believe 22% is herd immunity, I believe you're alone in that. Doctor, what exactly is herd immunity? What was that exchange about? 
Herd immunity is actually an idea that comes out of vaccines. And we find that when a certain proportion of a population is immune after receiving a vaccine, that that will prevent the disease from spreading. The amount of population that has to be immune after getting a vaccine depends on how transmissible the virus is. So for measles, you have to have 95% immune after vaccination. And for something like uh, pertussis maybe, which is a little bit less transmissible, that number could be lower. Estimates are right now that we would need at least 60% of people to be immune in order to prevent COVID from spreading. But that number could be actually very different. No one has reached anything like that yet. Uh, is it possible to have herd immunity with COVID? It's not clear. So we do know that many people make antibodies and are able to get over their infection, so there is some immunity. But we also know that people can get reinfected and that those antibodies go away. There's additional evidence that our T cells, which don't make antibodies, but could also make different kinds of immune responses in order to help protect us from the virus, may be really important in protecting us in the future. We just don't know enough to have any understanding of what we would need to have herd immunity. And it certainly isn't antibodies in less than 20% or around 20% of the population. Uh, Dr. Fauci was really speaking for all of us. Uh, last Monday, the, uh, on Monday, the CDC removed language from their website about airborne aerosol transmission of the virus beyond six feet, something which seems to reflect current scientific thinking in terms of the potential impact of aerosol droplets. Uh, is, is there still any doubt about how the virus is transmitted? No, there isn't. Um, we know that definitely the actual larger droplet or droplet transmission that happens within six feet is the most important way that COVID is spread. But we also know that certain times and certain things can make aerosols more common. Those are the smaller droplets that can stay in the air a little longer. They are important when you are singing, speaking forcefully, or having certain medical procedures done. And then also possibly when you're exercising, but we're still learning about that those mean that it's more important to be more than six feet of, that the ventilation inside of buildings is going to make a big difference as we come inside um, the airborne transmission that we see with measles and tuberculosis is uh, very uncommon with with covid we're not seeing that kind of spread it's more aerosols and droplets there is, as you know, concern in some quarters that the CDC is being influenced politically is that a concern you share I'm absolutely concerned about that. Um, it, it is difficult for me to understand why they've made recommendations, such as there is a recommendation on their website saying that children in their desks in school that are six feet apart can take their masks off. But aerosol transmission would say that's a terrible idea. Um, and then the fact that they removed that aerosol, I don't know about you and your workplaces, but if we happen to post something accidentally that was a bit too early, we would immediately try and get that sorted out and post the correct version right away. And it's been many days since they put that up. And I find it difficult to believe that that, that, is, that there is that much disagreement amongst the scientists about what was in the original message. And last question, the administration, as you know, has been pushing for a vaccine to be uh, produced as soon as possible. Uh, how does one know, how, does the, how can the public know if a vaccine, say one that comes out before election day, how do you know that uh, the vaccine is a good one? Well, I'm very worried about the idea of a vaccine being approved before election day. There's just no way that they've been able to follow the, the patients who have, or people who have received this vaccine, these vaccines long enough to know that they are really as safe as we expect a vaccine to be. Remember, we'd have to give this to hundreds of millions of people. So even rare events could be somewhat common. That said, as Dr. Fauci said earlier today, that um, if the there's overwhelmingly good data, it is possible that we are able to make a determination earlier. But I think that it's just still a little too early to know that by uh, election day. I think that, um, that there's going to need to be a lot more independent assessment of the situation. And unfortunately, I, I think we're going to have to do a little second guessing on what the FDA comes up with. That's where we'll have to leave it. Dr. Emily Landon, thank you so much for your insights. We appreciate it. And up next, former Bear James Big Cat Williams on the Lake Gale Sayers, plus a preview of this Sunday's matchup. So please stay with us. 
Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. The Bears are 2-0, but they barely eked out a win against the Giants last week after dominating the first half. Up next, the winless but free-scoring Atlanta Falcons, who put up 39 points against the Cowboys in a one-point loss last week. Joining us now to give us his take on the Bears and the clash against the Falcons is former Bears offensive lineman James Big Cat Williams. Welcome back. Uh, so first, Big Cat, what is your reaction to the death of uh, Bears legend Gail Sayers? Uh, well, you know, it was hard. It was hard information to hear. I had an opportunity to met, meet Gail when I first got to Chicago back in 1991. And, you know, he was still that lively vibrant guy that, that you always heard about in the locker room. And then as time went on, you just noticed that you know, things were breaking down, went from walking to, you know, being in a wheelchair. And when you're talking about a phenomenal athlete that was way before his time, uh, you know, it's hard to watch. But, you know, he's still, every time I saw him, was willing to carry on a good conversation and you know you just you just hate to see things like that happen but you you do realize that it's a part of life but he is someone that will be remembered forever for you know not only the things that he did on the field but the things he was able to accomplish off the field and on that note you know what do you think his legacy will be well of course you know a hall of fame kick returner um that anyone would have loved to have seen in this era of football. You know, you go back and you watch YouTube and see some of the things that he was able to do on the field in his, you know, short period of time because because of injury. Um, you know, injuries that nowadays might have kept him sidelined for a couple months, you know, at that point in time were things that could end a career. So he is, you know, he, he's an all-time great, always will be, and, you know, he's someone that the organization and the players for the Bears will miss. So looking at the Bears, Bears versus Giants uh, last weekend, tale of two halves and maybe two Trubiskys. Uh, Bears and Trubisky looked like they were on their way to an easy win uh, based on the first half. What changed in the second half? Well, I think – you look at the way the first half went. They ran the ball well. They were able to do play action off of the run. And they were able to put points on the board. And then you look in the second half, and you're talking about two turnovers, one off of a tip ball off during play action, and then another one that was a nice throw to the corner of the end zone, to the pylon in the end zone, and it was just a better play by a New York defensive back. So, you know, there were two plays that you would like to have back, but two plays that it could have gone either way. They could have turned, one could have turned out for a nice gain and a first down, and the other one could have been a touchdown, but neither one went the Bears' way. You know, the Bears are 2-0, and and wins, it seems like they can be hard to come by in the NFL. You know, aside from the record, do you think the team is improved this year? Uh, I think the team looks a lot like they did last year. Offensive, unfortunately, um, you know, you need to see the Bears put together two halves, two halves of consistency. Um, they have done a good job in spurts. Now you want to see them put it all together. And facing an Atlanta team like they're about to face, they need to be able to put it all together because Atlanta has the personnel to put points up. You know, they're averaging 32 points a game. So they have the personnel to put points on the board. So Bears signed uh, running back Tariq Cohen to a three-year contract extension. Here's a little of what uh, Coach Matt Nagy uh, said about Cohen today. I think there's probably more of an emphasis in balancing how many touches that he gets as a running back. And then on top of that, uh, I really feel like he's, he's taken the challenge that we've given him as a coaching staff to become – um, a, a more well-rounded back. And so far, I like the way he's handled that. 
What do you think about this deal, Big Cat? Uh, I think it's a good deal. I think the Cohen deal was something that they needed to get done. He's an explosive part of their offense and their special team. And his contract wasn't as difficult to do as the Allen Robinson, Allen Robinson contract. Um, you know, Cohen is kind of set in where he is and what he does for a living. You know he's a backup running back. You know he's a um, special teams phenom, if you want to say. But, you know, that, that pay scale is right around where it should be. Okay, so um, Falcons might be without star uh, receiver Julio Jones. If he's unable to play, how much of a loss is that for the Falcons? Uh, the Falcons are they're, they're, they're a deep offense. You know, Julio Jones being the one of the focal points on that offense is great and he helps to take some of the pressure off of some of the other players that they have but when you have uh calvin ridley and um what's the kid's name hurst the tight end and these are these are weapons that they use a great deal so the bears have to worry a about a lot more than Julio Jones right now. You also have Gurley coming out of the backfield. In 10 seconds, Big Cat, keys for the Bears to bring home a win. Is it going to happen? Uh, I think that the defense has to play well. We talked about the offensive weapons for the Falcons, and you know that pass rush that we saw a little bit of versus New York, we have to really see it hit home versus okay. Atlanta. And we'll have to I'm going to give it a 27-23 Atlanta. But if the Bears are able to run the ball, I change my prediction. <laughs> if they can run the ball, <laughs> we'll come back and just change it, like in post. All right. <laughs> Thanks to uh, James Bicat Williams, as always. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it, Bears. And if any of you Bears fans would like to ask a question to Big Cat, please send them along on our social media or email them to us to Chicago Tonight at WTTW.com and put Big Cat in the subject line. And now, Paris, we go back to you. Go Bears. That's all I have to say. Thanks, Brandis. Still to come on Chicago tonight, former Illinois governor discusses his experience in prison for federal corruption. We hear from a community leader who heads a network of block clubs on the city's south side. And though Chicago's lakefront has been closed, there's one legitimate way to spend a day at the beach. But first, some more of today's top stories. Chicago's famed Boys Town community is no more. The LGBTQ friendly section of Lakeview, traditionally known as Boys Town, will officially change its name to North Halstead for marketing purposes. It's in response to criticism that Boys Town was not an inclusive enough name to describe the character of the neighborhood. The name change was announced by the North Halstead Business Alliance, which represents more than 100 businesses on the Halstead Street corridor. Meanwhile, the Illinois Department of Public Health reports more than 2,200 new cases of the coronavirus in the last 24 hours, including 30 confirmed deaths. That brings the state's total caseload to more than 281,000 and the total death toll to 8,500. The seven-day rolling positivity rate is 3.5 percent. The church is on the list of America's most endangered historic places. The Roberts Temple Church of God in Christ is where the funeral and visitation was held for Emmett Till in 1955 and where his mother Mamie Till Mobley famously asked that her son be held in open casket. Here you see some historic footage from PBS. The church today has structural issues and is rarely used, but it made the National Trust for Historic Preservation's list of America's 11 most endangered historic places with the hope that the designation can bring a new wave of investment for rehabilitation. And now we check back in with Amanda Vinicky, who's reporting live from Little Village as part of our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series. Amanda. Yes, Paris, I'm joined by State Representative Edgar Gonzalez Jr. He is covers, represents the 21st District, which covers much of Little Village. And thanks so much for joining us. Now, cases in Little Village, or the zip code at least, that comprises this area, make up more than 5% of Chicago's total confirmed COVID-19 caseload. How are you seeing that manifest in day-to-day -day life here? 
Uh, well, you know, everybody has had to adapt to COVID-19. I mean, everybody's doing, wearing masks. Um, everybody's being super careful. Everybody, for the most part, is staying six feet apart uh, from each other in stores. Like, even right here, we're in front of El Milagro. And when people get up here um, and buy tortillas, they actually line up six feet apart. And there's stuff on the, on the floor so people know. So I think people have pretty much adapted. You know, I think it's still pretty scary. People are still... Uh, you know, just trying to be sure they're as careful as possible. And that's why we've been, uh, you know, my office in collaboration with other offices, uh, we've been sure to, you know, give out PPE, hand sanitizers, anything that people might need to, you know, uh, stay safe during these times. I witnessed that line actually outside, so it seems limiting the number of people in the store. Myself, such a long line that I wasn't <laughs> able to go in and get anything for, for me. Now, speaking of coronavirus, you, in fact, were diagnosed or had COVID-19. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What was that like for you? You're you're young. Were you one of those who was asymptomatic? Uh, you know, at the at first, I really did not feel anything at all. Um, but eventually, I started having a lot of phlegm, started coughing, uh, intermittent headaches, and then once I lost my sense of taste and smell, I knew I had it. So, uh, you know, it was. Uh, I'd say I took it pretty well um, but you know my mom my dad and my sister they all caught it my dad works at UIC hospital uh, so you know that's kind of how we got it and you know we try to be careful but uh, in the end like we all got sick uh, but you know we all took it kind of differently my my mom especially she's kind of asthmatic so it, it did hit her pretty uh, pretty heavily but now we're all doing okay uh, so you know I cannot stress enough you know like socially distance co like cover your mouths like just wash your hands Presumably people are maybe more going to listen to you because you've had that personal experience. Now, uh, um, you were appointed to the Illinois House, I think, in January, mm -hmm. So, but you are uncontested as this election comes up. Uh, assuming he remains as Speaker of the Illinois House, you will be asked who to vote for. Do you expect that you are going to vote for Mike Madigan as Illinois House Speaker, despite all of the corruption issues that he is facing and denies, by the way? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, he hasn't asked yet. So, you know, once once that question pops up, uh, then, you know, I will consider. Uh, but, you know, at the time being, like, my biggest focus right now is on making sure that people in my district are getting counted for the census and are taking the precautions necessary uh, for COVID, with COVID-19. Census events like you just had one? Yes, we had one. We actually had a bunch last week. Uh, we had two laundromat events where basically if you come and fill out the census, you know, we would give you uh, a free wash. Uh, on Wednesday last week, uh, we had the governor the mayor county president come up and also if you came to do your census you got a free taco some pan dulce uh, you know just trying to represent the uh, the area um, and we've been doing that we're still coming up with new ideas so you know now that we're in the final stretch and you know the deadline is coming on the 30th you know we want to be sure that we count as many people as possible and we will have more on the census coming up in an interview here in little village just ahead but thank you so very much representative edgar gonzalez jr back to you guys in the studio Thank you very much. And up next, former Illinois Governor George Ryan on his time in prison. So stick around. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Frankel Foundation. Early in the program, we discussed former Illinois Governor George Ryan's new book, Until I Could Be Sure, How I Stopped the Death Penalty in Illinois. In it, he details his philosophy surrounding the death penalty, which he placed a moratorium on in 1999. A few years after his term as governor ended, Ryan was convicted of 18 felony corruption charges and sentenced to six and a half years in prison. Here he is on November 6, 2007, the day before he reported to federal prison. And I will report to the federal corrections facility in Oxford, Wisconsin, as ordered tomorrow morning, but I do so with a clear conscience. And I have said since the beginning of this 10-year ordeal that I'm innocent, and I intend to prove that. And former Illinois Governor George Ryan joins us once again from his home in Kankakee. Uh, Governor Ryan, I want to get to your own uh, um, experience in prison, but I, I want you to finish uh, your story from before. You're talking about your decision on the death penalty moratorium, and then years later to issue blanket commutations for more than 100 folks on death row. Tell us about that decision. Well, uh, when I made the moratorium, everybody said, uh, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to probably uh, take a look at the cases and see if I can uh, commute the sentences to some of these people. I was in Oregon, I believe, giving a speech about this, uh, and. Uh, one of the reporters asked me about what I was going to do with the commutations to commute the sentences. And I said, well, I'm going to 
read all the cases and find out who I might think needs to be exonerated and who doesn't. Uh, so he said, well, don't tell me you would, you would commute the sentences of all people on death row. And I said, you know, I never gave it a thought, but yeah, I might do that. Well, of course, that was a big, little, everybody got excited about that. And so I continued to study the cases one by one. I took those cases with me every place I went and studied. I got all 167 of them. And uh, finally decided that I could not make that decision. My main concern was the execution of an innocent person. And there was very, uh, there was a lot of people that were very close that were innocent that almost got executed. I didn't want to leave office saying that, uh, sitting in the paper the next day, that some fellow had been executed, that he was innocent, found innocent, but it was too late for him. So I said, the only thing that I can really do is commute all 167 of these people to, to prison for life. So nobody got out of prison. Everybody was committed to uh, life in prison without parole. And I, uh, I thought I sure still think that I did the right thing, and I would continue to. I, I'd do it again if I had to. And clearly, it weighed, all those decisions weighed on your conscience. I want to talk about your own uh, corruption conviction. Obviously, in that clip, you had maintained your innocence. Uh, you write in the epilogue a little bit about the Willis children, the, the six kids that were killed at the hands of the truck driver uh, that had gotten his license through the Secretary of State's office and had been found to, to pay a bribe. It, looking back on all this, do, do you feel responsible for a culture? Uh, of pay to play in the Secretary of State's office, or w was that how politics was done back back then? No, I, I had the, the Willis children had nothing to do with my conviction at all. They, they they couldn't even bring it up in the courtroom, so I can't. I, I don't understand, you know, why people think that I should be talking about that. I uh, uh, didn't have anything, and and the other thing is, uh, Paris, that uh, some of the laws that I was convicted of are no longer uh, laws. They've been, uh, they've been taken off the books and uh, have uh, uh, not, they don't, I mean, they don't exist anymore. So, and if you followed the news here in the last week or so, the United States Attorney uh, Barr made the statement that the FBI had uh, some fellows in the, involved in the FBI, not all of them, but some people who are just headhunters and they're there to try and make a name for themselves and they'll do about anything to convict people like me or people that are innocent and uh, don't care about it. We've had several cases of that. We had it with uh, uh, Burge, the sergeant, uh, the lieutenant who's on the Chicago police force that he was torturing individuals to get false convictions, convictions from them. And so there's a, there's, there's a lot. You're talking about story. former police commander, John Burge, who, who had, had tortured. You're, you're, you're basically comparing the U.S. attorneys to John Burge as saying they're headhunters. No, I'm, I'm saying I'm saying what the United States Attorney said. That's not me. Uh, the United States Attorney made the statement that some of the FBI people were a, a little overzealous in, the, in their prosecution efforts, and they were kind of headhunters and looking to promote themselves more than anything else. And so, but but I'm not con comparing them to Bird. Bird tortured people to get confessions out of them. Right, and, and, and you write write a lot about. Stop. And you write a lot about that in your book, how, how, how uncomfortable you were with that. Well, what about your successor, Governor Blagojevich, who had campaigned on cleaning up corruption and then was convicted uh, on, on political corruption, perhaps that was much broader than what, what you were convicted on. What did you make of that? Well, I, I, uh, I thought he, his, pay, his, his sentence was pretty harsh, 14 years. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty bad sentence, and I thought that I'm glad to see that uh, the, the president uh, commuted his sentence to out. You know, he had a, a young family at home, and you know, going to prison isn't. It, it doesn't really solve a whole lot of things. You don't do much in prison to learn anything, to get involved with anything. They could have. They could have taken me or him and put us in the public service someplace. Would have been a lot better than well, sitting around the prison doing nothing. Clearly, clearly, you have, you have some sympathy for for Governor Blagojevich, who had served uh, several years. Um, Governor Ryan, uh, how do you want to be remembered ultimately? I mean, you, you were nominated for the Nobel Prize uh, for your moratorium and the commutation of sentences. Is, is this your legacy? That and, and if you look at Illinois, I mean, they did adopt uh, criminal justice reforms after you were gone, and then uh, the uh, death penalty is abolished in 2011. Do you feel vindicated by all that? Well, I don't know about that. I'll, I'll leave that up to the historian, what my legacy is, but I know that... Uh, 
uh, the, the, uh, the, the commutations uh, were a thing that I, I had to really think about hard. And, uh, but I, you know, I, I, I'm really not, I'm interested, interested about my book. It took me a long time to write it and to think about it. And I'm only hope, you know, there's still 28 states that have the death penalty plus the United States. And I think there were a couple of fellows executed either today or yesterday in the federal prison over in Terre Haute. Uh, we got to do away with the death penalty. It's, it's, uh, not, uh, it's not a deterrent in any fashion and it's, uh, just kind of barbaric. All right, Governor Ryan, it's a fascinating read uh, until I could be sure how I stopped the death penalty in Illinois. My thanks again to former Illinois Governor George Ryan. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. What a conversation. Thank you, Paris. Chicago has historically been divided into 77 community areas, usually with more than one neighborhood in each area. Each neighborhood is built out of blocks. Those blocks are the bricks of the community, and the mortar is often the president of the block clubs. In our Chicago Portrait series, we look at interesting, colorful characters who reflect the personality and diversity which makes our communities unique. Producer Mark Vitale brings us the story of Quayle Quaza. I grew up in uh, North Lawndale in K-Town, and I remember my mother, she would take charge of making sure that, you know, the block was, was uh, was together and during uh, cleanup week. We, we didn't call it spring break, it was cleanup week. I hate a cleanup week. <laughs> Keeping things clean is just one goal of the more than 300 block clubs around the city. Quayle Quaza is president of his block in the Brainerd neighborhood near 90th and Racine. He also heads Club 21, a chain of block clubs in and around the 21st Ward. And we're a network of block clubs around the city and some suburbs as well, south, south, south suburbs. And we're block clubs that work together to try to make the community better. Block club presidents are voted in and sworn in. Typically what happens is there's probably somebody on every block who's involved in the, in the block and involved in the community. So that's like a no-brainer. This person is going to be the one to represent us. Quayley has been a pivotal uh, role model for the block clubs in our ward. He has uh, helped us to get sidewalks done, tree stumps pulled out, helping the, the seniors be mobile. And especially now that we have personally lost our president, uh, he has stepped in to help us to continue. Block Club President Sherman Pittman passed away in March. One of our Block Club presidents was one of the first to die from COVID. It, it really hit us hard. Successful Block Clubs are usually rooted in just knowing one another. Know your neighbors. We're not trying to get into each other's business. But we want you to at least be able to help if you see something that's going wrong. I was surprised when I campaigned and knocking on the doors, how many people don't know the people who live adjacent to them, let alone know the people who live at the end of the block. Block clubs work with CAPS, the Chicago Alternative Policing Strategy. We, we need the police, but we want to work with the police uh, when we need them. So if there's some things that we can take care of, we want to be able to take care of those things to free the police up to take care of the more serious issues. Other activities include a community garden. Quaza gave us a tour of the big garden late in the season. He has been mentoring high school students for 38 years, and he's continuing his own education. I write my dissertation on black clubs. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm at National Lewis University working on a PhD in community psychology. And let's bring back, it takes a village to, to raise a child. Let's, let's, let's get back into that program. I just would like for more people that are not involved to please step up. We are all we have. Our goal is to try to make the community more prosperous, uh, safe, and beautiful. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. Block clubs grew out of efforts by the National Urban League to address the needs of blacks who were migrating from the rural south to northern cities. The Chicago chapter of the Urban League was founded in 1916. You can find out more on our website. And now we check back in with Amanda Vinicky in Chicago's Little Village neighborhood where she spent the day reporting for our Chicago Tonight in Your Neighborhood series. Amanda. 
Brandis, it is crunch time for the 2020 census count, which officially ends on Wednesday, just six days away. The deadline is especially pressing here in Little Village, where the response rates in sections of the neighborhood are well below the city average. Community groups are out on the streets canvassing, putting up yard signs, trying to reach as many people as possible before time runs out. Earlier today, we spoke with Anel Sanson. She's an organizer leading census efforts here with the organization Mujeres Latinas en Acción, and she says it has been all hands on deck. So we're six days away. September 30th is the last day to how to respond to the census. So we are out here pushing it. We're out here uh, at events, canvassing, doing lid drops, uh, putting yard signs, walking up to people on the street, just making sure that, you know, we're getting these counts up because unfortunately in Little Village itself, we're still very low. Little Village has long been known as the epicenter of Chicago's Mexican-American community. It is home to a lot of immigrants, many of whom are undocumented. And Sanson says fear over the Trump administration's attempt to put on a citizenship question, which did not actually make it on the census form, still is a lingering fear for some residents. And she says that could be contributing to the lower response rate. I believe that it's the mistrust uh, that the community still has. Uh, you know, we knew about the citizenship question that they wanted to add on the census. That was a big thing, right? Uh, and that's what we're doing. We're making sure that they know that that's no longer, that's no longer on the questionnaire. Uh, to trust uh, that their information be private. You know, it's just going back to, uh, you know, ICE being in our communities. It just plays a role that it's just, there's no trust anymore. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do, educate them that their information is definitely uh, safe. It's not shared, that the citizenship question is no longer there. And this is for the benefit uh, for their communities and their families. And not only that, it's the one thing that we're, we could all, you know, come together and be part of. Sanson says that effort, all of that encouragement is slowly working. Slowly but surely these past few weeks, they have slowly increased from what it was, from what it really was. You know, during the pandemic, we had to go on quarantine. There wasn't much that we could do. We couldn't be out. We were out canvassing. We were out door knocking, having one on one conversations with the community. Everything was going great. But then COVID happened. We all had a quarantine. We couldn't have that direct contact with the community. But um, now, you know, we're doing what we can with the time that we have. Well, Sanson says most residents have responded positively to all of that outreach. She says there are some who are never going to. For the most part, uh, I just feel like uh, it's just we need to educate, right? Sometimes we fear what we don't know. So when someone takes the time to explain to you uh, and, you know, tell you what it is, how it's going to benefit you and, you know, you'd be able to change that person's mind. But there's a very few there that just definitely they're not going to risk it. They're not going to try it. They just it's not their top priority. She and others will continue to be out with a whole lot of events planned for this weekend as well as all throughout really on Wednesday. Again, that deadline roughly midnight on Wednesday to get your census form in. And with that, Brandis, back to you. Crunch time. Like you said, Amanda, thank you. And for more on the census, be sure to tune into Chicago Tonight Latino Voices on Saturday and Chicago Tonight Black Voices on Sunday, both at 6 p.m. Up next, National Public Lands Day, what it is and how you can celebrate. But first, a look at the weather. Saturday is National Public Lands Day, the country's largest single day volunteer event for public lands. The Cook County Forest Preserve is celebrating and has some ideas for how you can give back to Mother Nature. WTTW News reporter Patty Wetley joins us now with the details. So Patty, how is the Cook County Forest Preserve celebrating and what are they asking for in return? Yeah, well, essentially they're kind of throwing a party for themselves. We're all invited, but they would like us to clean up 
after ourselves, essentially. Um, so many of the forest preserves nature centers were closed during the height of the pandemic. They're now open and they have a lot of activities, educational and otherwise planned for people on Saturday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. We've got links in our article. There's so much for people to do from nature hikes to meeting critters up close and personal to scavenger hunts. Um, but you might want to stick around, pick up some supplies like gloves and trash bags and do some cleanup for nature while you're there. And do some cleanup. So before yes. I let you go, you wrote another story earlier this week about how people can enjoy the beaches, um, even though they've been technically closed <laughs> right. uh, all summer, unfortunately. <laughs> Tell us what that's about. Yeah, here's a little workaround. Again, if you want to pitch in and clean up the Shedd Aquarium, the Alliance for Great Lakes and Chicago Park District, I have been partnering all week on a series of beach cleanups. And there's a couple left. There's one on Friday at Calumet Park. And then there's multiple opportunities to pitch in at 63rd Street Beach on Saturday. So you can get a little sand between your toes, get your beach on, um, but you're going to have to work for it. <laughs> Not quite the same thing as uh, rubbing I on the know. copper tone. And <laughs> it's laughing. something. It's something. <laughs> it is something. We've all been appreciating the outdoors lately. So, mm -hmm. okay. Thanks so much, Patty Wetley. Good to see you. Thanks, Brenda. And you can read Patty's full story on how to join a cleanup at a Chicago beach on our website, where you'll also find her story on National Public Lands Day. It's all at WTTW.com slash news. And that's our show for this Thursday night. Please join us tomorrow night. Live at 7 for the Week in Review. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm named by elite lawyers as the top aviation firm in the country in 2020.